okay preach uh, good evening good evening to all my friends uh, across in fact we can probably say my nearby countries also welcome you all for one more academic evening uh, today it's going to be an interesting topic and a, a very very uh, very famous and excellent teacher of our country is going to be with us and he will be introduced by my friend justin bar justin in fact is uh, now a home i mean the household name for the cardiology circle of uh, most of us in tamil nadu not only an excellent cardiologist good clinician good interventionist has done a pioneering work in improving the standard of care in private and greatly in a vast way in the government sector is contribution to the semi management of tamil nadu is an immense one i want to register that to all my friends who are listening to this it is my pleasure to invite my friend justin paul who is a product of sri chitra who is currently a professor of cardiology at madras medical college and taking care of uh, several aspects of cardiology from clinical to intervention and has a great interest in my field electrophysiology also justin it is my pleasure to invite you to start the proceeding by invite, introducing today's speaker dr vishay thank you uh, thank you very much uh, dr murli for the wonderful words i'm not too sure i deserve these niceness of the words anyway thank you for the opportunity and it is indeed a great pleasure to introduce to you the nawab of oud uh, dr rishi shetty uh, the the cardia if you write a letter dr rishi shetty lucknow it goes there to his house so that is his popularity in the place he is a professor at king george medical university lucknow and uh, he is a very uh, what shall i say very interested clinician very powerful academician and very good orator i have listened to a lot of his talks which are precisely to the point but mostly they were all 20 30 and 40 minutes talks so i have seen him excel in sprints i never knew he runs marathon too now he is going to take the charge of you know leading you through the next one and a half hours i am waiting to listen from him he has done a lot of uh, research lot of publications on his name and the students of kgmu they just uh, uh, you know adore him like anything so it is my pleasant privilege to introduce to you my good friend dr rishi thank you so before going into dr rishi shethi's lecture uh, let me go with this uh, on behalf of our department of cardiology history here Welcome you all over to Dr. Rishi Shetty sir. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Justin, for the kind introduction. I I hope I am audible to everyone clearly. Is this much volume okay? Yeah, fine. I mean, you are audible to us, to me at least, very nicely audible. Okay. So, uh, I thank you. I. it was a very kind introduction and around 10 days back when dr bhupati approached me for the talk um you know we all have been fighting this covid and and all the things and i was very interested in teaching but the topic which was allotted to me 
seemed like a very Herculean task because he wanted to speak to, uh, we wanted me to speak to you all about the entire cardiovascular examination. And that was a little bit of a challenge because uh, each one of the topics in examination, whether you take a general examination or you take a pulse or a JVP or dynamic auscultation or heart sounds would in itself be one lecture full and to take everything and to do justice, especially to those students who are undergoing about to uh, step into their DM final year examination. I wanted to do uh, justice to, to this talk. So um, I accepted, I, I would, So let's see, um, let's see what I've decided is that I, it was a good churning, mental churning for me also to go back to my DM notes, to dig them out from, um, from, from their graves and then to read them like a DM final year student would be reading them. And then I decided, of course, it is not possible to cover everything in every minutia. But I try to, but I have tried to bring out those facts that are important for examination that many a time students tend to waste, that there are controversies related to certain things. And I have just tried to, um, try to streamline the entire process of clinical examination of a cardiology case, uh, specifically with the DM cardiology exit examination in mind. So, uh, in today's discussion, we would start off with general examination. We would go for, uh, we go to the, so I, I believe that how I approached clinical examination and given the fact here that uh, somebody has already taught you history examination and how to construct upon history in terms of differential diagnosis, uh, having, so this probably is the second part of it. When you come to the examination, I feel that the examination of a cardiology case should be divided into three parts. The first part is the general examination. The pulse, JVP, and blood pressure should account for the middle part, and the final part should account for the examination of the precordium divided into inspection and palpation poking together, percussion, and followed by auscultation. And when you have cleared your history and you are on your clinical examination, especially after the time that you have done your general examination, pulse, JVP, and blood pressure examination, and have done a little bit of your examination of the apex and precordium, before you pick up your stethoscope, your 95% of diagnosis should be certain in your mind. So your stethoscope should come at a place where you just have to fill in the gaps and try to make the final diagnosis. So I would take on general examination and what is expected out of general examination and salient features of general examination that need more elaboration, I would discuss with you all. I would discuss JVP with you all. I have omitted for the present uh, lecture pulse and blood pressure uh, for the sake of becoming not becoming too horrendously long a lecture. And there is a small anecdote that I remember by pulse and I would come to that later. So I would first deal with the general examination part of it. Then I would come to the, to the JVP and the salient features of JVP. I would then come to the inspection and palpation of the precordium and what are the points that we should be looking for in DM examination. We would come to the hard sounds, the murmurs, the clicks, and finally ending with the dynamic auscultation. So I would try to cover these in, in bits and pieces as much as possible, given the fact that most of you would be aware about the basics of them and I would be especially dealing with small nuances. Few caveats I would like to stay here. I say here that number one is that in, in two hours, it's not possible to cover everything. So there would be certain points that would be missed. Number two is that every, every region and every institute have a diff, little bit different kind of teaching. So if you hear something that is not very much aligned to something that has been taught to you in your respective institutions, then probably you should go back and check and consult with your own consultants and present the way you present in the examination as you have presented all across over the years in your 
in your um, in your clinics because I mean your internal examinations would be examiners would be there to help you in the times of crisis in your examination. Uh, and third point is that most of this uh, most of these uh, things are from my DM cardiology notes and they have been made from standard textbooks. They, they have evolved out of uh, Abrahams and Jewel Constants and, uh, and Braunwald and, um, and the classical clinical teaching that we have gone through in our institutes. So starting off with some salient pearls, it's almost a given fact that when you go, when you get a case in your DM examination, you more or less know the diagnosis from somehow from your friends. But I've always taught my residents to start with an empty slate, because if you are biased towards the diagnosis at the time of your history taking an examination, then you are likely to get into those mental traps and the examiner is going to find out those mental traps. The real thing the examiner is looking at is not to get to a final diagnosis, but he is trying to trying to analyze your your way of thinking. He's trying to get to what is your methodology in approaching the history. How much is your how much broad based is your knowledge when you talk about differential diagnosis? What is the methodology of your thinking, and are you good at relating history to clinical findings and picking up good clinical findings? and try to construct the whole story. So he's not interested really in the diagnosis, but your state, of, but, your, but the working of your mind. So try to start as much as possible on an empty slate in your mind or uh, in DM cardiology examination. Whenever you come to physical examination, many a times you get so obsessed with the findings that you are getting in physical examination that you tend to forget about whatever you have discussed in your history and your differential diagnosis. While, while examining a patient, keep your history and all the possible differential diagnosis in mind because your examination is nothing but a construct over them. And then while you are making your final diagnosis and presenting it, your history, your differential diagnosis discussion, your physical examination, all should match and be represented in your final diagnosis. So do not delink different part of your clinical examination from one another. Try to see the whole picture. I mean, try to see the, suppose you, get, suppose you get a hard clinical finding and at the same point of time, suppose you get a forceful sustained apex that is classical for LV outflow obstruction. And at the same point of time, you are getting a somewhat doubtful rumble that is representing an Austin flit. And there is a debate that whether there is, whether the aortic regurgitation or a stenosis is the predominant lesion, go for the hard finding rather than trying to search for some fancy small finding and trying to impress your examiner, try to do not lose sight of your hard finding for any soft finding and try to see the whole picture with entire clinical examination and spectrum and not just rely too much upon one soft finding and trying to construct the whole story around it. Try to see the entire picture. Do not miss the hard endpoints for the soft, fancy clinical finding. And listen to your examiner. Many a times, you, you are very convinced about something and you're, you, will, you would like to put it more emphatically across to your examiner, but your examiner has a different point of view. A little firm in your findings if you are sure, but not bordering arrogance or not bordering stubbornness. Listen to your examiner. He has been there around. He's probably trying to give you some hint. Pick up those hints. Be ready to adapt. And if there is a discrepancy in findings um, between you and the examiner, of course, you have all the right to put it across forward, but do listen to your examiner. Many a times they are giving you a hint to guide you towards a certain diagnosis. So these are the salient pearls you must keep in mind when you go into a clinical examination, especially at the DM cardiology level. And the examiner is really looking to find the consultant in you and not the student in you. So try to be firm and emphatic, but at the same point of time, be ready to adapt if there is a difference of opinion. So, so it, was a, it was a trick that I used to have that most of us, many of us actually will get a rheumatic heart disease as our long case. And I had prepared certain lines which I used to say for, for pulse, for JVP, for general examination. For example, if I get a, a, 
uh, a case where the findings are limited only to precordial examination. Everything else is relatively normal. I don't want to waste my time discussing general examination with my examiner and trying to say fancy things which I may be caught. I can get away with the entire general examination and all the other um, systemic examination in one line by saying, suppose there is a rheumatic heart disease where the findings are limited only to precordium and probably to pulse and JVP. So I can get away by ge across general examination and every other systemic examination by saying one simple line, not one, but a couple of simple lines, that there is no pallor ictris edema cyanosis clubbing. There is no hepatosplenomegaly, per abdominal examination, respiratory system examination, and musculoskeletal examination are within normal limits. So within these three lines, you have covered the entire general examination and all the other system examination, and you have focused the examiner's attention where you want it to be, rather than speaking out the general examination in great detail and examiner trying to find out, I mean, about, about body weight, about habitus, about BMIs and things like that. If you want to focus as a DM cardiology on the precordium and the case that you are interested in and everything is normal, get across your general examination and systemic examination by saying a few simple lines that there is no pallor, atris, edema, cyanosis, clubbing, there's no hepatosplenomegaly, per abdominal examination, respiratory system examination, and musculoskeletal examination are within normal limits. So these, again, this is, this is a simple line also. And at the same point of time, these are all the points that you really need to know um, when you, you need to see actually, when you are seeing a, a cardiology case. Of course, if there, are, if, there are, if there is a complicated case with infective endocarditis, then you will have to look for all the peripheral stigma of infective endocarditis. If there is a case, um, uh, let's say of cyanotic heart disease and there are findings elsewhere, of course, you will have to go and search elsewhere. You cannot miss them. But if uh, what I'm saying is that if everything is normal, then get across this phase fast and move on to the real world. And these points are not to be missed points also. You can get across them fast also and not to be missed points also. You cannot miss these systemic examination and you cannot miss these general examinations in your cardiology case. Now, out of this, um, I have picked up three to discuss today. One is edema, cyanosis, and clubbing. Uh, we all have been hearing about it, but edema, sometimes examiners want to, want to expose your clinical skills also. It is seen by applying pressure over distal end of tibia for at least 10 seconds using three fingers. And over sacrum, if the patient is in the recumbent position, at least 4.5 liters fluid is required before an edema appears in the body. And when describing edema, describe it as unilateral and bilateral, whereas unilateral edema would be, uh, would be for, for deep vein thrombosis and, and uh, infections of this particular like so phalariasis, et cetera. Bilateral would be limited to heart failures and other conditions uh, related to cardiac diseases. So define edema as unilateral or bilateral and define it as pitting or non-pitting, non-pitting in mixed edema and pitting in cases of heart failure. You may go into another finesse of saying that it's a fast recovery pitting or a slow recovery pitting, which little bit separates it from the renal failure, from the CHF, the fast recovering less than 40 seconds, the recovery of the pitting leads to the low albumin states like nephrotic syndrome and slow recovery more than one minute of pitting points more towards congestive heart failure. So in edema, describe your edema as unilateral or bilateral pitting or non-pitting. And you may try to gain some brownie points by saying fast recovery of pitting or slow recovery of pitting. Uh, cyanosis generally appears, it's, it's a deep subject. I am not going into every detail and every differential diagnosis of cyanosis, but I'm just trying to pick up a few clinical points that are relevant and sometimes we tend to forget. So central cyanosis appears when the reduced hemoglobin in venous system becomes more than five gram percent. The normal levels are less than two gram percents. And then there is, can be cyanosis without cardiac, respiratory, or any peripheral causes in polycythemia when the reduced hemoglobin may be, may be raised, the ruddy cyanosis in methemoglobinemia and self hemoglobinemia. And of course, in a patient of cyanotic heart disease, you may not get cyanosis in, pace, in cases where there's severe anemia, 
sometimes in dark skinned individuals, of course, you have to look for the mucous membranes also, and sometimes when the collaterals are adequate. So many a times, the examiners may play around with you asking you these, these questions. And we'll come to the diagnosis of anemia in cyanotic heart disease as we move forward. That's another interesting thing to learn. So cyanosis, you have to look for the cardiac cyanosis and respiratory cyanosis in, in, in cyanosis. The first question any examiner asks you whether it's a central cyanosis or peripheral cyanosis. And we, and almost 95% of the, of the people, students who are giving the examination would stop at just the site that where is the cyanosis located. But a very good thing is that if you have read your topics well, and if you know that what are the differentiating points for various things, then many a times if the examiner asks you a question, and of course you have time to prepare for your, for your viva once you have completed your writing your case. So just keep these things in mind. Try to speak in a more comprehensive way so that the examiner, of course, everybody knows these things, but when you speak it, in as three or four points, if, you, if somebody asks you, uh, why is it central cyanosis? And you just say that it is located in the central part of the mucous membranes and tongue and uvula, and you stop at that, you are not wrong. But if you say of all the other things, if you have done warming of limb, if you have tried to exercise the patient and seen, if you have also given 100% oxygen and seen the variation in oxygen saturation, uh, then probably the examiner knows that you know your job and you have earned a lot of, lot of good points to the examiners. So central cyanosis is cardiac and respiratory, whereas peripheral is because of abnormal extraction of oxygen and because uh, in the periphery and because of peripheral vasoconstriction location, we all know. Clubbing and polycythemia are a part of central cyanosis and they are not present in peripheral cyanosis. In central cyanosis, the extremities are warm, whereas in peripheral cyanosis, the extremities are cold. On warming the limbs, there's no effect on central cyanosis, but the peripheral cyanosis may decrease. On exercising, the central cyanosis will usually worsen, while the peripheral cyanosis may not have any effect or it may actually improve. And giving 100% oxygen uh, generally has no effect on, on peripheral cyanosis, but it may improve the respiratory part of the central cyanosis. So uh, taking a cue from this, this thing, this examination, try to remember all these points in your, in your mind. And whenever somebody asks you a question, try to give a more comprehensive answers. So as the examiner sees the overall uh, depth of your knowledge and your meticulousness in order to approach uh, a case with, with a little broad spectrum of knowledge. And, and he also becomes aware that you have read your part well. So, um, just last week, we were, we were taking examination um, from uh, in, in Calcutta, I mean, online examination that was conducted out of Calcutta. And these questions were being asked uh, by one of the very senior examiners of sinosis at birth. And most of the people were saying TOF actually. So TOF generally, TOF is the most common case that you will get as a cyanotic heart disease uh, when your child is anything between six months to one year or, or older, but the most common cause of cyanosis at birth would probably be DTGA and other causes of cyanosis at birth would be TAPVC, hypoplastic left heart, tricuspid atresia, and so on and so forth. So why is it, sometimes it is asked, why is it that in, in cyanosis appears later? Most of these have cyanotic heart disease from the birth. Almost all of them have cyanotic heart disease at the birth. Why does the cyanosis appear later? The mechanisms are because of the growth of the child, there is increase in the oxygen consumption, there is closure of PDA, there is increase in the severity of, of, of uh, pulmonary stenosis, and there is a little change from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin. These are the causes of deferred cyanosis or delayed onset cyanosis in most of the cyanotic heart diseases. Of course, when you are talking about cyanosis, you must also look for the, um, this is more for theoretical and trying to search, but try to look for the various complications of a cyanosis also in your case, you should ask history and try to look for any neurological signs and hematological examination. Uh, so many a times it is asked that uh, the patient has a hemoglobin of, of 18. Now, whether he's anemic or not, one way of course is to look 
for the iron deficiency under the microscope and, and see for microstatic hyperchromic picture. But another way to find out whether a person who is obviously cyanotic, is he anemic or not? And, and, and I don't know if any of you knows this formula. Uh, the formula is you, you subtract uh, uh, 34 minus oxygen saturation by four. And that should be the normal hemoglobin, 34 minus oxygen saturation divided by four, oxygen saturation divided by four uh, should be subtracted from 34. And the figure you get is the figure uh, of your hemoglobin levels for that amount of oxygen saturation. And you can calculate roughly, suppose the, hemo suppose the normal hemoglobin at that point of time is, uh, is, coming to be, uh, is coming to be 19 and your patient has a hemoglobin of 17 is obviously anemic. So coming to clubbing. So clubbing is the widening of fingertips, enlargement of distal volar pair of fat, convexity of nail contour, and loss of nail angle. So the normal angle between your nail and the cuticle, uh, skin cuticle, is around 15 degrees. And that is probably one of the earliest thing to go away. The subjective assessment of clubbing is done by grades of clubbing. We will be discussing grades of clubbing in the next slide. But there is also an objective method to judge clubbing. And that is, in normal people, the distal enteral phalangeal joint is broader than the base of your nail. But in clubbing, the base of the nail becomes wider than your distal interphalangeal joint. So when you divide for each finger, you can divide the width at the base of the nail divided by the width at the distal interphalangeal joint, and that would be a digit ratio. And once the base of the nail is broader, the digit ratio would be more than one. So when you count the digit ratio in all the 10 fingers, if the value is more than 10, then your patient can be objectively called to have clubbing. The grade of clubbing, there are some confusions, uh, there are some controversies in different books, but um, generally speaking, the grade one was the softening of nail beds. Grade two would be obliteration of the nail angle in nail bed, the, 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 the angle of nail bed is gone. And something you can do is a Shamroth's window test. You can keep both the nails. And if you can see a window between the two nails, it is not clubbed. And the first thing, and the Shamroth window test is that the small window that is formed by your base of your nail angle when you combine two figures, it goes away in clubbing. So that's the Shamroth window test. Grade three clubbing is the increase in curvature of the nail in the AP diameter leading to parrot beaking. Grade four is when the curvature is increased on all the sides called as the drumsticks. And grade five can be described as the hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, which is a complex finding of clubbing, the subperiosteal newborn formation, synovial effusion, and periosteal pain. I'm sorry for the typo, pain on elevation of hand. So hypertrophic osteoarthropathy is many times seen in tumors, but uh, this is the general glare of clubbing. Sometimes the drumstick and parrot breaking are classified as grade three itself, and hypertrophic osteoarthropathy uh, can be taken as grade four, but these are small nuances. Generally speaking, uh, this can be told, uh, this can be mentioned as the grade of your clubbing. The causes of clubbing, we all know, but just to, just to briefly summarize, uh, in pulmonary, you have bronchogenic carcinoma, fibrosing alveolitis, and any superlative lung disease will give rise to clubbing. In cardiac, you have cyanotic heart diseases and infective endocarditis. In GIT, the Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and biliary cirrhosis, endocrine, myxedema, acromegaly. It may be hereditary, and it may be associated with the subclavian artery aneurysms or pancos tumors of the lung. So clubbing um, is something I dealt into detail a little bit about general examination on uh, um, things with special reference to edema, clubbing, and cyanosis. Uh, mechanisms of clubbing, you know, are sometimes a very purist examination will ask you. All these things are probably not of too much value in terms of making a diagnosis. But if your exam is going fine, if, you, if your examiner sees a potential and he's an old time purist examination, there is a neurogenic, neurogenic theory where the tumor specially associated with tumors, where there's vagal stimulation and that leads to um, clubbing. There's a hormonal theory um, where, uh, where all the hormones that are supposed to be destroyed in lungs, for example, prostaglandins and gonadotropins, estrogens, 
uh, they get circulated. They get they when they are bypassing the lung um, because of a right to left shunt. Then of course um, they they tend to cause more growth in terms of the distal periphery in, and cause clubbing. There's hypoxic theory of opening up of capillary vascular beds, and there's a platelet theory. The large megakaryocytes that are generally removed in the pulmonary capillaries in right to left shunt, these escape this removal from pulmonary capillaries and they get deposited in the distal capillary endothelium, giving rise to various growth factors and proliferation of the soft tissue. So uh, can I take a short break now and uh, bring in just Justin or Bhupati or any questions at this point of time? Uh, Am I audible to everyone or? Yeah, you are, you are audible. I'm <laughs> sure I think uh, you will need a break uh, talking for quite some time. Uh, is there uh, any questions in the chat box? Yes, sir, there are two, cup, two questions. Okay. Would you like to uh, read, uh, read it, sir? Or? Yeah, maybe you can just read so that it okay. can be Dr. Sandeep, uh, and any, asked, and uh, any comments from, from Dr. Justin about whatever we have? So you, in fact, uh, you did a very, uh, very nice job. You gave the very crucial points that I think the take-home messages. Dr. Rishi came in the uh, gave in the beginning itself. Number one, start with an empty slate. Always, when you go to evaluate a patient, don't go with the bias. Don't go with the prompted uh, diagnosis. Then your eyes are going to see only points pertaining to the diagnosis that was prompted to you by somebody. So please go with an empty slate. Your unprompted mind is always better than a prompted mind. Then he said the whole picture, have a look at it. It is not just because in the general examination, I find this, I need to do this. Uh, no, it has to fit the whole picture. You can ignore certain soft points, but never ignore the hard points. These are some of the important uh, lessons you need to understand in the whole picture. And as you see, in every step, he reminded you that you need to come to a, a diagnosis, closer to the diagnosis. By the end of history taking, you should have an idea, what am I dealing with? And by the time you finish the general examination, you have an idea, you can narrow down. Then in the inspection and palpation, you still can narrow down. And finally, you narrow it down further in the auscultation. So the very crucial points Dr. Rishi had take, given in the first uh, few slides, uh, I think it be it, you will do better if you remember all these things as you're evaluating a patient. Okay. Dr. Sandeep Mohanty has asked uh, how to identify uh, uh, mixed cyanosis in patients who are having both central cyanosis and peripheral cyanosis. Uh, question to Dr. Justin Paul or Dr. Rishishethi. Would you like to take that? Rishi? Would you like to take that? I. You can continue. You can continue. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, moving on to, uh, moving on to the JVP. Yeah. So, uh, so when we so salient features of the JVP, uh, so JVP is a, uh, you of course look for JVP. Uh, let me just first come to this thing. Whenever you see the neck pulsations in JVP and carotid pulse, you have to differentiate and uh, why is it a JVP and why is it uh, not a carotid pulse? The JVP is located a little laterally while carotid pulse is located a little laterally. JVP is double peaking while as carotid is single peaking. JVP is the upper limit can be seen, but there's no upper limit of the carotid. JVP change with position, changes with position and on inspiration. And it has got more prominent downstrokes while carotids will not change with position or inspiration. And it has got a prominent upstroke. JVP is better visible and it can be obliterated by pressure. Carotid is better palpable and it cannot be obliterated by pressure. And an abdominal compression JVP might be raised while there would be no effect on carotid. So coming to the different waves of JVP, there are, there are essentially speaking three positive waves, A, C, and V, and there are two descents, the X descent and the Y descent. Uh, the corresponding findings in heart sounds and, and pulse is, 
this this is from my from my dm notes and if you see if you start from the a wave a wave is always more prominent than b wave in normal conditions and a wave would correspond to the atrial contraction phase that is the late part of atrial diastole and therefore it will correspond to an s4 the c wave will correspond to the closure of the tricuspid valve and pushing the tricuspid valve into the atria while the v wave will respond to the atrial diastole and the and the blood filling in the atrium um, during this phase and try to increase uh, trying to increase the pressure so in the x descent the first part of x descent uh, between a wave and c wave the atria have gone into contraction and then they go into the relaxation so the first down slope of x wave is because of the atrial relaxation and the and the tricuspid valves close at c wave and so the next part of x descent is because of the descent of the base the, the c wave has come because of the isovolumetric contraction of the ventricle and the tricuspid valve being pushed back into the atria when it goes into systole there is a descent of the tricuspid valve back into the ventricle and it leads to leads to a little bit more part of the exa little bit more dilatation of the atria and pressure becomes uh, lower and the second part of the x descent comes here uh, the v wave would roughly correspond to the peak of the pulse it corresponds to the time where the atrial filling is happening and somewhere at this part of the v wave peak of the e wave the tricuspid valve will open and the blood will gush out in the early diastolic part um, uh, early diastole the the rapid flow part from atria to ventricle will happen during the y descent and and following which the late diastole in late diastole there would again be an atrial contraction and a wave will come so a c and v are three prominent waves and x descent and y descent are the two descents and the mechanisms are as what we have discussed as of as now and uh in generally in normal pulse in normal jvp the x descent is more prominent than the y descent and the a wave is more prominent than the v wave so whenever the jvp is normal in your dm examination you 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 just don't say jvp is normal and get away with it of course uh, most of the students try to avoid jvp and move forward but then it is even if you are trying to describe a normal jvp you may say that jvp is normal in height and waveform and has got normal respiratory variation uh, so at least this three line should be told about jvp normal jvp is normal in height and waveform and there is a normal respiratory variation of jvp would would describe a normal jvp finding all the prominence and the abnormalities of the jvp can be described uh, on this chart based upon the normal physiology of jvp as as we are uh, um, uh, if you, if you remember the the physiology why each and every wave is happening every pathology can be can be described as such so if so a wave is because of the atrial contraction if there is no atrial contraction as in atrial fibrillation uh, then there would be no a wave giant a waves will happen um, or canon a waves will happen whenever the atria is contracting against a force it can be the tricuspid valve it can be at the level of tricuspid valve which may be in part of the tricuspid stenosis tricuspid atresia uh, right atrial myxomas or it may be at the level of ventricle where the ventricle right ventricle is less compliant as in case of pulmonary arterial hypertension right ventricular hypertrophy or pulmonary stenosis uh, when when the heart when the atria contracts against a completely closed ventricle in in an uh, in an idio uh, in a in a rhythm well in an ectopic beat or in complete heart block when the atrial contraction has happened at the same point of time the valve is completely closed you may get a giant a wave a giant v wave or more commonly a c v wave when we will get you get so c uh, wave is because of the isovolumetric contraction uh, and v wave is because of the filling of the ventricle um, uh, after the tricuspid valve is closed so suppose in case of tricuspid regurgitation where uh, where the c wave where the entire 
um, blood of the ventricle will go into the uh, into the right atria you get a giant cv wave kind of picture uh, and that is pathognomic for tr and sometimes you get in asd uh, you get a rapid y descent in constrictive pericarditis you you get an absent x descent of course there is no a wave to a wave so there would be an x descent that would be absent uh, in cases of atrial fibrillation and there is a prominent x descent in cardiac tamponade so there's a prominent x descent in the cardiac tamponade there is a rapid y descent in cp and constrictive pericarditis so uh, a bit about kusmal sign in generally speaking whenever you inspire inside your your the jvp will fall down but uh, the height of the jvp will become lower but if on inspiration your venous pressures increase and your height of jvp increases it is the kusmal sign and it occurs when the right ventricle becomes less compliant or has less capacity to augment any further venous return and it cannot be handled by rv right ventricle as happens in constrictive pericarditis severe congestive heart failures uh, right ventricular myocardial infarctions and so on and so forth there would be no fall or rather rise in the venous pressures on inspiration and that's a small sign uh, hepato juggler reflux so it's not reflex but it is reflux you apply a gentle firm pressure on the right upper quadrant or the epigastrium many a times in patients of congestive heart failure or right upper quadrant would be tender because of a tender liver so you apply a sustained firm pressure over the epigastrium or right upper quadrant for 30 to 60 seconds and this generally will cause a rise in jvp of around less than 1 cm in height and it will be non sustained if you continue to apply pressure then after 10 seconds your your jvp height will come down that's the normal response but hepato juggler reflux is possible it is it is tried it is it is an examination that you do do not do generally in a very gross congestive heart failure but if there is um, if there is a doubt in your right heart failure if the findings are a little soft then you can uh, exacerbate those findings by doing a hepato juggler reflex reflux and in hepato juggler reflux when you apply the pressure the positive hepato juggler reflexes when you apply this firm pressure for 30 to 60 seconds the rise of the jvp is more than 1 cm and it is sustained throughout the time the pressure is applied and that is the finding of eminent uh, right heart failure tricuspid regurgitations or hypervolemia or fluid overloads so uh, coming on to the examination of precordium uh, inspection and palpation so the first thing is bulge so whenever you look at the precordium and you see a bulge uh, there are only a few things it can be in a grown up adult a uh, chamber enlargement can never produce a bulge in the precordium the bulge in the precordium can only happen when the chamber enlargement has been present before your ribs were fused essentially speaking before 9 to 10 years of age so if you get a bulge in the precordium of a chamber enlargement that essentially means the heart disease and the chamber enlargement has been present in the early childhood period of the case and should point something about a congenital heart disease the bulge in adults may come but they are generally because of the aneurysms and dilatation of the arteries where they may be may or may not be pulsatile or because of tumors but chamber enlargement per se does not produce a bulge and the chest wall deformities in a grown up adult when you come to the apical area there are two things which even uh, experienced uh, people sometimes miss and you have to comment on two things and this is apex beat and apical impulse and they are not the same apex beat is defined as the lowermost and the outermost point of a definite cardiac impulse and just because it's the point it only is a location we we talk about that it the deviation in apex beat whether it's out or down and out or whether it's normal only tell you whether a cardiomegaly is present or not it may give you some idea 
whether the cardiomegaly is RV or LV type, but generally speaking, you should avoid making such an assumption based upon apex beat. Apex beat is generally the lowermost and the outermost point of a definite cardiac impulse. It is not the point of maximum cardiac impulse. It is the point of a definite cardiac impulse. That's the definition. And it only tells you, and only and only tells you whether a cardiomegaly is present or not. Apical impulse is, is something that you describe the apex completely, and it can be described in the form of force, whether it's forceful or not, duration, whether it's sustained or not, its size, what is the size in, in, in centimeters of the apical impulse that you are feeling, and what is the size in terms of an intercostal space? Is it limited to one intercostal space, or is, does it occupy more than one intercostal space? And then in apical impulse, you can describe additional thrills or a palpable S3, S4, opening snap, and so on and so forth. In the next part of palpation is the pulmonary area. And in pulmonary area, you, you generally can, can look for pulmonary artery and palpable P2. They are, again, not the same things. When you are saying a palpable pulmonary artery, you are meaning a pulmonary artery that is dilated in a high flow situation. And when you are talking about a palpable P2, you are committing yourself to a pulmonary arterial hypertension. So palpable P2 is a gentle tap-like sound of feeling that you feel in, in the second uh, left intercostal space in the pulmonary area. And palpable pulmonary artery and palpable P2 are not interchangeable. So use these terms carefully, uh, trying to fix it in your diagnosis and be very clear in what you are trying to say in pulmonary area, whether you are trying to say it's a palpable P2 or whether you are trying to say that the pulmonary artery is palpable. In parasternal area, you look for the RV and LA. There are two chambers that may produce pulsations in the parasternal area. The LA pulsations um, would, would be delayed a little, would be a little separate and divorced from an apex beat where the RV pulsations will come with the apex beat. Generally speaking, we get RV as parasternal um, uh, impulse. And here again, there is a bit of controversy between different examiners. Uh, what do you call a parasternal heave? How do you grade them? So generally speaking, you must try to keep your hand straight and try to feel for uh, in the parasternal area for RV by, by the edge of your hand, keeping your elbow straight and trying to use your shoulder as a fulcrum so as to give you the better, so the shoulder will give you a better feel. Otherwise, uh, with the elbow takes away the movements. And grade one uh, impulse is when you only feel an impulse and your hand is not lifting. Grade two is when your hand is lifting, but you can suppress the lift. And grade three is when you cannot suppress the lift and your hand is moving up and down. So many examiner will relate only grade three parasternal impulse as a heave. Uh, that's again another nomenclature. You may say parasternal heave only for grade three pulsations, or you may just say parasternal pulsations, grade one, grade two, and grade three. That would be more scientific. In epigastrium, uh, you try to look for RV when you what you have seen in the parasternal area. And the common question here is whether it's RV or it's aortic pulsations. You you try to flex the leg of the patient, try to make his abdomen soft and gently palpate um, the epigastrium uh, uh, through the, through the uh, pulp of your hand. If you feel the pulsations on the pulp, it is aorta. If you feel the pulsations of the tip of your finger, it is RV. And you must also look for towards the back of the patient and try to see for any collaterals in cases, especially of cyanotic heart disease. So what's the normal apex? And here I would say not apex beat, but what's a normal apical impulse? Remember, apex beat is just a point. It tells you about cardiac dilatation and nothing else. The apical impulse is generally a gentle tap. So everything in apex is quantifiable except the force. So force is something that is a general feeling. It's soft or it's forceful. It's gentle or it's forceful. But then the duration is quantifiable. Generally, normal apical impulse is, occupies less than half of a systole. And that, that brings us to the question, how, how do you feel an apical impulse? And so apical impulse, uh, the, how you feel apical impulse, there are 
different theories that are associated with it. Generally, you feel the apex beat and the apical impulse during the first isovolumetric contraction phase of the ventricle. When the ventricle is contracting against both tricuspid and the seminilar valves is closed, there is fluid inside it, it goes into a torsion anti-clockwise rotation, the apex bit turns up and this, this, this turned up anti-clockwise rotating apex strikes your chest wall and gives you a feeling. As soon as your semilunar valve open up, there is no LVOT obstruction, the blood gushes out and the apex of your left ventricle moves away from the chest wall. So you feel for the apical beat or the apical impulse um, only during the isovolumetric contraction phase of the ventricle. So anything, uh, and generally, so it will occupy less than the first half of systole. If it is longer than first half of systole, then it's a sustained apex, and that will be found in cases of LV outflow obstruction, where the heart takes uh, the the it, where it where it takes a longer period for the blood to be ejected, and the tip of the the apex of the left ventricle remains attached uh, to uh, the anterior chest wall for a longer period of time. So. A normal apical impulse will occupy less than half of systole. If it is occupying more than 50% of the systole, it's a sustained apex. Similarly, another quantifiable is the area of the apex. Generally, the area is less than 2.5 centimeters square and it occupies one intercostal space. If the area becomes more than 2.5 centimeters square or if the apical impulse occupies more than one intercostal space, then it's called as the diffuse apex generally associated uh, with volume overload states. The location um, is, remember the location would be of the apex beat and not the apical impulse. Apex beat location is generally located one centimeter internal to the mid clavicular line or within 10 centimeters to mid sternal line in an adult uh, in the fourth or the fifth intercostal space. And generally in normal apical impulse, RV or diastolic impulses are not palpable. So this again, this, this table below is very important because this is again, many a times uh, we have students who, who fumble here. So there are, when you combine force and sustenance, there are four combinations which are possible. So if it's a, if it's a not forceful, not sustained apex, and that's the normal apex, how you define it. If it's a forceful apex, but it is not sustained, and that's classically for hyperdynamic states, classically seen in aortic regurgitation uh, in the cases that we get in aortic regurgitation. If the apex is both forceful and sustained, that's classical for LVOD obstruction because it is forceful because the LV is hypertrophied and uh, in it's contracting more powerfully. And at the same point of time, it is sustained because in order to, to, to develop the pressure and to eject the blood, there is obstruction. It takes a longer time to eject the same amount of blood and the, the tip of the LV to go down. It takes a longer period of time. So you get a sustained apex. And this thing is important. If the apex is sustained, but it is not forceful, then it generally signifies left ventricular systolic dysfunction. It means that um, there's no LVOT obstruction, but the muscles are weak, so it's, they are not forceful, but they are taking a longer time to generate the same amount of force to eject the blood and for the, the muscle to move away from the chest wall. So not these four, by these four combination, when we speak your epical, when you speak your epical impulse, you are generally committing yourself to one diagnosis of the other uh, by using just the different combination of how forceful or how sustained the apex was. So be careful while making such statements because you are really committing yourself. Apical impulse is a very hard finding, not, not easy to miss. So when you are making an assumption based upon the force and sustenance, you are actually committing yourself to a specific diagnosis. So be careful when you make such assumptions. Coming to the auscultations, the heart sounds, the clicks and the various heart sounds, I, I would uh, not be going into create great detail, but just trying to pick up salient features from each one. 
S1, we all know, consists of two components, the mitral closing and the tricuspid closing, the M1 and the T1 component. Many a times, the only thing that we are, discuss, we are discussing in examination is the intensity, whether the S1 is soft or whether the S1 is loud. And the intensity of S1 is determined by many factors. It is, discover, it is, it is, um, it is determined by the structural integrity of micros, mitral, uh, most commonly mitral, we discuss mitral or tricuspid valve apparatus. So if there is any break in the structural integrity of an AV valve, the M1 or T1 of that particular part would be softer. If there is any caudal rupture, if there is a calcification, if there is um, mitral, uh, if there is uh, loss of integrity, if there is a tissue of infective endocarditis, not allowing the valve to close, if there is a structural integrity of the mitral valve apparatus or the tricuspid valve apparatus is compromised, then it would lead to softening of that hard sound. So S1 would be soft. Uh, when we talk about mitral valve, and let's stick ourselves to mitral for the time being. When we talk about mitral valve, a very important determinant of the intensity of S1 is the position and the excursion of the mitral valve leaflets at the onset of the ventricular systole. So the farther they would be into the ventricle at the onset of the ventricular systole, the, with the more bang they will try to coapt and will produce a larger or a higher sound. So if there is a prolonged flow of mitral uh, valve in cases of mitral stenosis, uh, in, in cases of ASD where there's a prolonged flow, if there is short PR interval, all these conditions, the mitral valve are quite open at the time of the onset of the ventricular systole. And therefore, when they come back, they come back with a bang and, and they produce a more loud or a louder S1. Similarly, if the mitral valve prematurely closes in cases of, of aortic regurgitation, or if there is a prolonged PR, then the mitral valve is already partially closed at the onset of uh, ventricular systole. And in that case, the S1 would be soft. The integrity of isovolumetric contraction uh, is also important if there is mitral regurgitation or ventricular septal defects or aortic regurgitation, then again, S1 would be soft. S1 is also dependent on myocardial contractility and heart rate. If the heart rate is more and the myocardial contractility is more, then S1 would be loud. If the heart rate is slow or the myocardial contractility is compromised, as in cases of cardiomyopathies, MIs, and various drugs like beta blockers, then the S1 would be soft. So coming to S2, which is something of um, important, and we, and I will take two or three slides to, do, to discuss various nuances of uh, S2. So uh, S2 is sometimes the nemesis for many of the students and as with JVP, you, you were supposed to say not just normal JVP and get, get away, you have to say that the JVP is normal in height and waveform. At the same point of time, you just cannot say normal S2 and get away with it. S1, nobody's going to ask you about M1 and T1, but in S2, people are really interested in A to P2 and you have to talk about the intensity of every each component and you have to talk about splitting. So S2 is something that is very important. It's again a very hard clinical endpoint as your apical impulse. And many a times the diagnoses are made or broken based upon the findings of S2. So S2 is something that we cannot escape. We all know that S2 compromises, comprises of uh, A2 and P2. And they are not exactly at the same time as the closure of semilunar valve. They occur a little after closure of the semilunar valve and they precisely coincide with the incisura of their great artery. So A2 will, con will coincide with the incisura of, of aorta and P2 would coincide with the incisura of pulmonary artery. And this is something called as the hangout interval. We all have heard about it. The hangout interval actually speaks of nothing but the real compliance of the, uh, of the vascular bed, the great artery is supplying the vascular, the, the compliance of pulmonary artery, the compliance of aorta. 
So the exact definition of a hangout interval that in time, it is a time distance between the pressure of ventricle and its great artery at the level of incisura. So if the incisura of the pulmonary artery is somewhere here, the time difference between the pressure of the ventricular tracing and the great artery tracing here, which for pulmonary artery roughly normal is around 65 millisecond, this is the hangout interval. The longer is the hangout interval, you have to imagine both aorta and pulmonary artery as expansive elastic structure. So aorta will have a shorter hangout interval. So the hangout interval in aorta would be somewhere around 20 to 30 milliseconds. So it will cause, it will go, it, it will expand and it will come back faster. So A2 will come before. So the shorter the hangout interval, the earlier the heart particular A2 or P2 will come. So in aorta, the, uh, the hangout interval of aorta is much less than the pulmonary interval for the simple reason that aorta is much less compliant as the pulmonary artery. Remember the pulmonary artery has to, you know, uh, is taking the entire systemic blood in a very small amount of space. Um, uh, and so the elasticity and the, com and, the, uh, and the compliance of the pulmonary vascular bed is much, much more than the systemic bed and especially the aorta. So the aorta expands and comes back and in coming back, it's producing A2. So hangout interval of aorta is less so A2 will come less. While as the pulmonary artery hangout interval, the expensile nature of the artery pulmonary artery is more, the expensile nature of the pulmonary artery would be more, the hangout interval would be more, so P2 would be coming at a later period of time. So that's the definition, and the hangout interval becomes, in, even in pulmonary artery, when the pulmonary artery becomes stiff, as in cases of pulmonary artery and hypertension, the hangout, just because it becomes less compliant, it is more stiff, therefore the hangout interval decreases so P2 would start coming closer to A2 and the A2 P2 gap would be decreased. So you have to, while describing the S2, you have to describe individually the intensity of both the components and what is the splitting like. The factors which influence the intensity of, of uh, an S2 or the individual component of S2 are most importantly the pressure across the valve. So the pressure in aorta is much higher than in pulmonary artery. So A2 would definitely be of much higher intensity than P2. So the main factor governing the intensity of A2 and P2 is the pressure beyond the valve. And it is also dependent upon the flow and the stenosis and regurgitation of pulmonary and aortic valve will actually decrease the intensity because it leads, it involves with the integrity of the opening um, and closing of the semilunar valves. So the valvular aortic stenosis or regurgitation will decrease the intensity of that sided A2 or P2, while pressure, higher pressure and higher flow across the valve will actually increase the intensity. Normally speaking, A2 is louder than P2 even in the pulmonary area. And that is now and when do we say that the P2 is loud? That's, that's many a times we get stuck. How do we define a loud P2? Because even in the pulmonary area, A2 is a louder sound as compared to P2 whenever we are hearing a splitting. So if A2 becomes, if P2 becomes equal to A2, even in the pulmonary area, it is actually a loud P2 and that would be classified as a mild degree of pH and mean pulmonary artery pressures here would be somewhere around 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. If P2 becomes louder than A2 in the pulmonary area, then it is a moderate degree, at least a moderate degree of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And if P2 becomes loud and banging and kind of starts to mask A2 in pulmonary area, uh, then it is a very severe pulmonary hypertension with mean pulmonary artery pressures over 50 and 60 millimeters of mercury. So one way of telling whether P2 is loud or not is to compare it with the A2 in the pulmonary area. Remembering that A2 is always louder if P2 is heard with the equal intensity or uh, 
any higher intensity than A2, even in the pulmonary area at the base of the heart, then P2 is loud and there is pulmonary arterial hypertension. That's the most common cause of loud P2. The other way of describing a loud P2 is if you can hear P2 away from the pulmonary area. Generally, P2 is localized to the pulmonary area. If you start to hear a splitting sound towards the apical area, anywhere going down, if you can hear a splitting at the apex, splitting of the um, S2 at the apex, then of course it is a it is a loud P2 because here now you are hearing a splitting. That means you are hearing a P2 at the apex. Therefore, it's a loud P2. So if the P2 becomes equal to a louder than A2, then it's a loud P2. If you start hearing P2 in any other area except the pulmonary area, then also it is a loud P2. So coming to the splitting. So normally speaking, when you inspire, the both A2 and P2 will tend to dissociate away from each other. So normal splitting, generally we speak, is that when both the components of A2 and P2 in the pulmonary area are heard during inspiration, but on expiration, a normal ear is not be able to identify it. So if you hear splitting only during inspiration, it generally can be classified as a normal splitting. Of course, there are nuances here, but generally a normal splitting is heard during clearly during inspiration. If you can hear splitting in both inspiration and expiration clearly, then it's a widely split P2. And here again, it can be wide and variable and wide and fixed. In wide and variable, you hear splitting in both inspiration and expiration, but the splitting becomes wider in inspiration. While it's in a wide and a fixed splitting, the splitting is heard in both the phases, but does not move with the respiration. A single P2 is when there is an absence of audible split in both the inspiration and expiration, in both inspiration and expiration, you are hearing just one single sound and that is classified clinically as a single S2. And then you have a reverse or a paradoxical splitting in which you have in inspiration, the splitting is not heard while on expiration, the splitting is heard. It happens when the P2 starts to come before A2 uh, for various reasons. For now, when it, it, the first gap becomes narrow, then there can be a single P2 and then a reverse or a paradoxical splitting may happen in a continuum of, uh, of narrow split. So reverse in reverse or paradoxical, you hear a split, not in, you, uh, not in inspiration, but you hear a split in expiration. Wide and fixed splitting is characteristic of ASD and right ventricle uh, failure. In, in both these conditions, the volume overload on the right side is already so much that in respiration, there's hardly any change in ASD. There's hardly any increase in the flow uh, on, on, uh, um, by, by, res by respiration, by inspiration. And in right heart failure, I mean, the, the right ventricle is not able to handle blood and to make the relevant changes in inspiration and expiration. So the splitting becomes wide at the same point of time fixed. When you say a single S2, one explanation can be, as you told, the A2 and P2 gap started to become narrow, a narrow split. It became single. And then if, if the disease progression increases or the severity increases, it may go, it may just cross over and become paradoxical. So the in-between period where the A2 and P2 are coming nearly at the same point, that may be one of the reasons of single S2. But many a times the cases that you get, especially in cyanotic heart disease, that is not the case. So single heart sound, single S2 is also found if only one valve is present, that is truncus arteriosus. If one valve is atretic or severely stenosed, as we get the case of pulmonary atresia or, or severe TOF, you don't hear a P2 component. Or if there is the, the orientation of the arteries is anterior posterior, uh, the pulmonary valve becomes posterior uh, and you don't hear it in TGA. And sometimes extreme loudness of one component of A2 or P2 uh, 
gives rise to you can't because one component is extremely loud sometimes in pulmonary arterial hypertension the p2 becomes so loud that you cannot hear a2 and that is called as a retrograde masking and this may also be one of the causes of single s2 so splitting of s2 we have been reading about it but widely split s2 the causes we know it can be electrical and mechanical so in any case of a wide split we need to have either the aortic a2 sound coming earlier or the p2 sound coming later so a2 sound can come early in cases of left ventricular premature beat in electrical setting and the p2 sound can be delayed in the right bundle branch block and therefore the splitting may be wide it's also found in all cases in which there is an increased flow across uh, that sided um, semi lunar valve for example asds and right ventricular failure um, in, in vsds so all these cases all these examples are causes of widely split s2 you can apply the reverse here in narrow or reverse splitting uh, you can have all the findings all the clinical conditions that can lead to a delay in the in the a2 or early uh, p2 will give rise to will give rise to a narrow or a reverse split and this may occur in left bundle branch block uh, right ventricular premature beat uh, aortic stenosis left ventricular failure hocm in aortic stenosis left ventricular failure hocm in all these conditions uh, the the a2 component is is a bit delayed and you get uh, a narrow or a reverse split of a2 dr justin you want to come in for a minute or yeah bhupati yeah sure you know i think if you need some rest we can take one or two yes, now and uh, we can always uh, i think dr rishi will need couple of uh, minutes rest he has been speaking maybe uh, what do you think bhupati should we address one or two questions here yes sir yes sir you please start addressing some of the questions sir let us start from up or from down either way either way we can just uh, i i don't know i i'm seeing some question is there a difference between a giant and a canon a wave there was another question that is asked a canon a wave is generally the name is used when the atria is contracting against a closed av valve that is the time we use the name canon a waves other times any other cause of a large a wave when it is large you can use a giant the term giant then some other question we asked to report if there is any symptom of clubbing on infective endocarditis that's one that's interesting question we actually don't know why it happens the presumed hypothesis uh, vegf related uh, thrombocytosis some of the platelets get clubbed in the, inside the capillaries they release the vegf uh, that is the presumed mechanism we actually don't know why it happens okay good it is again one dr sandeep mohanty sometimes we are asked to report that the a wave and the v wave height of jvp along with the mean jvp level so now this is a very important and a tough scenario often some of you are put into so there is what you need to understand is there is nothing called mean jugular venous pressure so we can have a mean right atrial pressure which is not by calculation but by damping in the lab by the damping of the diaphragm we get the mean values but we generally cannot calculate the mean right atrial pressure the mean left atrial pressure it is a not does not exist as a single point so clinically you will not be able to measure a mean jugular venous pressure you can say the top of the venous column jugular venous column jvp is this much height that's it i am not very keen on hair splitting on a wave height and v wave height that is what i I mean, I will uh, expect my, you know, students or uh, candidates to say that this is the height of the jugular venous pressure. Anybody, do you like uh, any of the panelists? Do you like uh, A wave height and V wave height? It will be extremely difficult, actually. I think it's not required. Sir. Most of the time, the examiners won't ask. Go to the text end. Yeah, I don't think this kind of things are happening now. So do not worry. Uh, the height of the venous column is fine. why is y wave absent in ts it is not absent it is slow doctor the reason why it is slow 
obviously the inflow into the right ventricle uh, the, because the tricuspid stenosis is going to be very slow. When the patient sits up from 45 degree position, the mean JVP column seems, don't say mean JVP column, but the JVP will remain. So how to explain this? This is, <laughs> uh, somebody would like to take this uh, answer. Something we have been teaching you from uh, the MBBS days. I, I think, you know, the center of the right atrium is supposed to be five centimeters below the sternal angle in the dose, uh, me, in the days uh, pre-CT era. But nowadays we know that these distances are variable. But whatever may be the height of the top of the jugular venous column, irrespective of the angle of the patient in the bed, the overall height is going to remain the same. So that is one reason why we put it at 45 years. If you put them at 30 degree, you'll be able to just see the tip of the oscillating waves. When you're able to see at 45 degree, so very simply, clinically, routinely, what do you do? Most of the time, we don't put them at 45 degree. We keep them at 90 degree and see if there is any waves, N not in your exam types. If you're seeing in 90 degree, you don't have to put them in 45 degree. You can measure the vertical height. What you really need to measure is the vertical height between the sternal angle and the top of the oscillating column. If you're able to see that in 90 degree, don't put them in 45 degree. And 45 degree is a degree used by convention because less than 45 degree it is generally not elevated. There's one more question, hepatojular reflux. Hepatojular reflux can be seen in right heart failure and in left heart failure. Whenever the patient's JVP is not elevated, but you want to elicit it, hepatojular, the hepatojular reflux is going to be positive. That means the, pul the presumed PCWP, pulmonary capillary ridge pressure, or the LVDP of the patient is kind of 15, less than 15. If the, that, that, is the, that is a way to correlate how we can extrapolate the PCWP from JVP. If you say the JVP is elevated just above the neck, of the just above the angle of just above the clavicle, then the presumed uh, PCWP is more than 15. There's a uh, data comparing it. There's a papers in JAMA uh, that published comparing the data between uh, neck, neck wave JVP. If you say that neck wave JVP is going to be uh, kind of five millimeter above the, uh, it's five millimeter elevated, then you can say that PCWP is at least 22. So there is a correlation between uh, JVP and PCWP. If I say that it's just elevated above the just seen above the uh, clavicle, that means the PCW is at least 15. If you say that is 5 millimeter above the clavicle, that means PCW is more than 22. And the other extrapolation is you can extrapolate uh, systolic pressure. Whatever I'm, uh, you can't, you can't generalize for every patient. If the, if the presumed JVP is going to be more than 22, then the presumed pulmonary artery systolic pressure is more than 44. These are all the uh, data of what people have confirmed with CAT studies. Uh, they cannot be 100% specific and 100% sensitive, but they goes with this. If someone asks, the JP is going to be elevated, what's the presumed PCWP? You can confidently say at least 15. If JP is not elevated and if you are eliciting the hepatogenic uh, reflux, that means the JP is less than 15 and you are trying to elicit the incipient left heart failure. I hope you understand that there is a reason behind why this is being told to you. Because the jugular venous pressure, particularly the diastolic period, it always correlates with the RV diastolic pressure, which correlates with the PA diastolic pressure, which correlates with the pulmonary venous pressure. And plus, you need to add the uh, 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 transpulmonary gradient. So that is the reason we are able to roughly correlate uh, this LV pressures or uh, LV diastolic pressures or the left heart pressures and that is one reason though initially for you how can jvp i mean hepatojugular reflex give me an idea about the left heart failure or incipient left heart failure this could be the reason uh, dr rishi should we yeah. continue now sure, sure, sure. Take some questions? No, we, are, we are we are good we are good okay okay, okay. so um we have traveled the journey to uh, the second heart sound. What is left ahead are uh, the S3, S4, various clicks, discussions about murmurs and dynamic auscultation. So uh, 
S3 and S4 are diastolic, low pitch sounds that are, that are heard um, sometimes in pathologies and sometimes as part of the normal physiology. Uh, all those S4, it is said that it is never uh, physiological, but it can be heard in the non-compliant ventricles of elderly. But S3 and S4 are both low pitch sounds. Being low pitch sounds, they are better heard with the bell of the stethoscope. And uh, it is said generally that uh, the first thing you do with your, when you pick up your stethoscopes, try to hear for the low pitch sounds. So in a silent room, um, if you are trying to hear for a LV S3, S4 and your clinical signs are going towards the direction, first try to listen with the bell of the stethoscope in S3 and S4, because many a time when you start to hear high pitch sounds, then your ears uh, are not very attuned to pick up low pitch uh, sounds like S3 and S4. So the S3 is an earlier diastolic sound. It comes during the early rapid filling phase of the diastole. And there are various theories, the, the valvular theory, the vascular theory, the impact and the external theory. Again, these theories are for theoretical purposes. You, you need not remember them, but it's generally speaking, uh, people, some people think it's the sound that originates out of valve by the rapid flow of blood between the, the atria and the ventricle. The most accepted theory is that where there is sudden deceleration of that rapidly flowing blood uh, against the, the myocardium, that produces, the, that's the vascular theory. There's an impact theory that in which the, you know, there is an impact of LV against the chest wall, but that is probably not so conducive. And then there's an external rotation theory that says that uh, the great arteries go into some sort of torsion during the time of systole and the release of this rotational torsion during the diastolic period gives rise to S3. Of course, clinically, these are, these are not for your examination point of view, but only lost in viva. When you hear an S3, you have to differentiate whether it's an LV S3 or an RV S3. You are hearing a low pitch sound early in the diastole. You have to find out whether it's an LV or an RV S3. The differentiating point are that the LV S3 would be more localized towards the apex, while the RV S3 would be at the left parasternal area. Uh, the RV S3 would be varying with inspiration. It will become more pronounced with patient in supine and leg elevation where there is more blood return to the right side of the heart, where the LVS3 would be more pronounced on the left lateral position. LV and RVS3s would be corroborating with near-sided murmurs and RVS3 right-sided murmurs and JVP and things like that. So you have to look for the entire picture. The causes of S3 may be physiological. It may be, um, it, you may get it in a child, a young adult or a pregnant female. There are S3-like sounds like pericardial knock and tumor plop. And pathological S3 is found in either left ventricle or right ventricle of failure or LV dilatation. Or they may be found whenever there is an increased flow into the ventricles, either from the great arteries or from the atria, increased flow to the diastole. And therefore, you may find that you may find it in cases of MR, TR, ASDs, biotic regurgitation, pulmonary regurgitations. So uh, S3 is generally found as, as in the constellation of ventricular failure or during any condition which leads to an increased flow into the ventricle during early part of diastole. S4, on the other hand, is also a low pitch sound of a diastole. It occurs more uh, in later in the course of diastole. It coincides with the atrial contraction phase that corresponds to the A wave of JVP, if you remember. And the prerequisites, the three prerequisites for S4 are that the patient should be in sinus rhythm, of course. If he's not in sinus rhythm, the atrial contraction is not happening in atrial fibrillation. The AV valve should be non stenosed. If it is stenosed, then you don't get uh, uh, an S4 kind of a sound. So if you are getting an, if you are saying S4 or, uh, or S3 in cases of a pure mitral stenosis, then there is something is wrong because um, in mitral stenosis, neither uh, you have an open valve, you have a stenosed valve. And at the same point of time, there is no um, increase in the blood, massive blood flow. So if it's an isolated stenosis and you are saying S3 and S4, something is wrong. So S4, a prerequisite is sinus rhythm. 
a non-stenosed AV valve and a non-compliant ventricle. The ventricle has to be non-compliant to produce S4. So when all these three prerequisites are there, then S4 is most likely present. And the common causes are sometimes in normal part in terms of normal aging, aging process uh, when, uh, when the ventricle is non-compliant in hypertension, in aortic stenosis, HOCM, acute AR, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so the clicks when we come to, so clicks can be, so there are two questions we have to ask ourselves whether the, the click is a high pitch sound produced in systole. It is produced, it can be produced at the level of semilunar valves or it can be produced at the level of great arteries. So the first question you have to ask whether it's a vascular click produced in the great arteries or it's a valvular click produced at the level of semilunar valves. And the second question you have to ask um, is whether, I mean, it's a right-sided click or a left-sided click. So pulmonary click in, in terms of in terms of valvular clicks, you have to ask yourself whether it's a pulmonary click or an aortic click. So the difference between a vascular click and a valvular clicks would be that in, in vascular clicks, just because they are, it, it's generally associated with a dilated and a high flow kind of arteries. So the intensity of S2 would be louder. The arteries, if, if it's, a pal, it's a pulmonary artery, on the right side, the pulmonary artery may be palpable. And the vascular clicks are generally not moving with respiration. And the valvular clicks may move uh, with respiration, especially on the right side. The pulmonary valvular click may move with respirations. The vascular clicks generally do not move with respiration. So when you talk about the aortic valvular click versus the pulmonary valvular click, the site is important, the aortic and the pulmonary area. The aortic valvular clicks are generally widely audible, while the pulmonary aortic clicks are generally localized to the pulmonary area. Aortic valvular clicks will not move with respiration, while pulmonary vascular clicks will become, they are not move, but they'll become softer or louder during inspiration. Um, they are generally better heard during expiration because in inspiration, uh, there is a theory that in inspiration that as the blood, uh, blood is pulled in inspiration during the ventricles, the partial closure, partial opening of pulmonary valves happen. And this can open only on the right side. And therefore the click is not heard during so well in inspiration as during expiration. While in left-sided uh, heart, I mean, no amount of respiration is good enough to overtake the pressure of the iota. So the aortic valvular click will never be affected by inspiration and expiration. So if a valvular click is becoming softer during inspiration and louder during expiration, then it is definitely originating out of pulmonary valve and not out of aortic valve or any other place. And then between aortic and the pulmonary valvular clicks, you have to look for the accompanying feature. If the accompanying features are of the right ventricular failure, right ventricular hypertrophy and things like that, and JVP, then it's a pulmonary click. So you have to go with the accompaniment. You have to go with the area. You have to go with the accompaniments. You have to go for the radiation. And at the same point of time, if the, the click is, is varying in intensity during inspiration and expiration, it is, uh, it is on the right side. As with any other right-sided murmur, the inspiration and expiration, the respiratory variation has more pronounced effect on all the findings on right side and little findings on little changes in findings on the left side of the heart. Murmurs was a huge, huge, huge topic, but uh, this, was, this was how I classified my murmurs in my DM notes. And uh, I just copy pasted that and we can, we can discuss it. Uh, I don't know how to go into each and every murmur, but generally speaking, you have systolic murmurs, diastolic and continuous murmurs. When we speak of continuous murmurs, these are generally not referred to as a to and fro murmurs occupying both systole and diastole, but these are generally spoken, when you say continuous murmurs, these murmurs should engulf the S2 into them. So these murmurs are continuous. The continuous murmurs are classically PDA, rupture sinus of Valsalva, venous hums, mammary scuffles, AV fistulas, and bronchial collaterals. Um, the systolic murmurs, so we all have been reading about it. So. Uh, 
but even in last year, Dr. Justin was there last week's examination. Many students were confusing between uh, the early systolic murmurs and, uh, and ejection systolic murmurs. So you have to remember whenever we say pan systolic, early systolic, mid systolic, late systolic, it has got a definite meaning to it and a definite meaning and a different cause. You, for each of these, if you see, there are hardly two or three murmurs except you know, a mid diastolic murmur or ejection systolic murmur. Uh, you can really, when you talk about a pan systolic murmur or an early systolic murmur or a late systolic murmur or an early diastolic murmur, this has got a very, very clear definitions and very, very specific causes. So whenever we use these terms, we are actually committing ourselves to a diagnosis. So, so we must know what are the timings of this murmur and we must know the differential diagnosis of these murmurs. For example, a pan systolic murmur should start with the S1 and should continue up to the S2. So it, it, the, both the heart sound should be involved and classic examples are mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation and ventricular septal defects. The early systolic murmurs should start with a S1, but they should end well before S2. They should not reach the S2 and you, and you, cannot, you cannot classify an ejection systolic murmur. Ejection systolic murmur is a mid systolic murmur, which is a peak in, and a, which, has, which has got a crescendo and a, dias, and a decrescendo where, and both the S1 and S2 are free. We cannot, you cannot describe a, early onset mid systolic murmur as an early systolic murmur. So early systolic murmur should start with S1 and it should end any time before S2. And there are very, very, just a classical, only four causes of early systolic murmurs. And these are very small muscular VSDs. The murmur starts and then the muscular VSD closes upon the VSD and the murmur does not continue up to S2. It can also be associated in very large VSDs with pH so that the VSDs, the blood starts to come uh, starting from the S1 into the right ventricle, but somewhere down the line, the ventricular pressures become high and it does not continue up to the S2. So very large VSDs with pulmonary hypertension would also constitute sometimes an early systolic murmurs. Acute MR, chronic MR is always pan systolic. Acute MR, the LA is not compliant yet to take that amount of load. So the murmur starts at the onset of S1, but it ends somewhere before S2 because the LA is not so compliant. It's an acute MR. So acute MR is also one of the causes for an early systolic murmur. And then the non-hypertensive TR, the normal pressure TR, the pan-systolic murmur for TR is for hypertensive TR with pulmonary arterial hypertension if there is an inherent tricuspid valve disease, intrinsic tricuspid valve disease, then the murmur of TR is not holosystolic. It will start with S1, but it will end somewhere between before S2, and that's a normal pressure or a low pressure TR murmur is also early systolic. All mid-systolic murmurs are, are, are ejection systolic. It can be classified as an ejection systolic murmur. They will be sparing. They will start after S1. They will finish before S2 and they will have a crescendo decrescendo pattern. It can be flow murmurs or it can be murmurs of various outflow obstructions of aortic and pulmonary valve. The late systolic murmurs are generally murmurs that will start somewhere in the mid of the systole, but will continue up to the S2. And that is classical for mitral valve prolapse syndrome. Uh, there is the, the mitral valve, the mitral valve, uh, the LV starts to contract. When LV reaches a critical volume, uh, uh, it's called the click volume, the, the prolapse will start, the click will happen, and the murmur will start somewhere after S1. It will not involve S1, it will start after S1. It will start with a click, once the critical click volume is reached, and it will continue up to the S2, and that's the classical late systolic murmur of mitral valve prolapse syndrome or sometimes of papillary muscle dysfunction. The diastolic murmurs, when you are seeing early diastolic murmur, the murmur has to occur 
between S2 and S1 now. So early diastolic murmur, because that's diastolic phase, early diastolic murmur will have to start from S2 and it will end in a decrescendo manner before S1. It will end somewhere before, somewhere in the middle part of diastole. It can be a long murmur and it can be a short murmur, but it will never continue up to the next S1. So it will, it will, it will be generally a decrescendo murmur and early diastolic murmurs are classically of aortic regurgitation and pulmonary regurgitation. Then you have a pre-systolic uh, murmur uh, that you can say it's a component. It can be a continuation of a mitral stenosis and pre-systolic murmur will, will, start off, uh, in, will start off somewhere in middle part of um, a diastole and it will occupy in the later part of diastole occupying uh, the S1 of that and it will be many a times associated with the accentuated S1 also. So that is the pre-systolic murmur of, of uh, mitral stenosis. It may also be found in uh, myxomas. And the mid-diastolic murmurs, the diagnosis are various. Uh, mitral stenosis murmur is classically described as a mid-diastolic murmur. It starts off in mid-diastole, but in patients who do not have atrial fibrillation, there is a very important pre-systolic component also, which cannot be missed. So a mitral stenosis murmur is both a mid-diastolic as well as a pre-systolic murmur, while classical mid-diastolic murmur, if you say, uh, may also happen as in mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis. It may also happen in valvulitis like catacombs murmur. It may happen with aortic valve regurgitations, uh, the Austin Flint murmur. It may happen um, in various flow increase across the mitral and tricuspid valve. You may get a short mid-diastolic rumble and which in mitral side, maybe because of mitral regurgitation, VSDs and PDAs in tricuspid side, it may be because of tricuspid regurgitation, ASDs, TAPVCs, and so on and so forth. So coming to the last part uh, of our conversation, and that is the dynamic auscultation. So dynamic auscultation is always and always for brownie points. It is uh, not the essential part of your clinical examination. And if you have reached a stage of dynamic auscultation and the examiner has started talking to you about dynamic auscultation, that probably most of your battle has been won. I, I have taken these two pictures because dynamic auscultation was my first uh, DM cardiology seminar when I joined DM cardiology course. At that point of time, we did not have trans uh, the PowerPoint presentations. We had transparencies. And we used to beautifully make these transparencies in various sorts of colors. And this is the printout of one of those transparencies. That's my first DM cardiology uh, presentation. And whatever I have learned, it's a build upon that build up on this only. So dynamic auscultation is a technique of altering circulatory dynamics by physiological or pharmacological maneuver and to see their effect on heart sounds and murmur. We have to remember that when should you do dynamic auscultations? How should you do examination and why you should do a dynamic auscultation? So remember that this is a common mistake that many of the students make in their examination that when the heart sounds are very clear, the when the tricuspid regurgitation is high pressure, uh, pan systolic tricuspid regurgitation, then they would also try to speak about whether it's increasing on respiration and what is the maneuver on leg raising. In a classical aortic regurgitation murmur, they would start to talk about hand grips and whether it's better heard in this position or that position. You do maneuvers only when there is a doubt only when there are faint murmurs, only when there are hard sounds or murmurs that you are confused whether you should make one diagnosis or the other, then you must do maneuvers to either accentuate your clinical findings or to make a differential diagnosis between a two confusing diagnosis. Don't do it as a part of the general workup when your signs are very clear and you just want to add a brownie point that would be leading to more confusion because when the murmurs and heart sounds are very clear, there is no need for you 
to go in for uh, dynamic auscultations or any maneuvers. How, uh, when we say valsalva, when we say hand grip, there is a method of doing it. When we say passive leg raising, there is a word passive. So there is a way to do it. So you must learn the right way. There's no point. You try to gain extra points by going into a, a scene, uh, by, into a scenario, and then you are doing it in the wrong way. And then the examiner, you know, goes back and, you know, he, uh, whatever good points you have earned early on in the case are also lost in the way. So you must know the right way to do it. And, you know, why you should do it. I don't think so in these days of echoes, it, most of the parts are required, but then it's a clinical skill development and you need it as an examiners, as future teachers, as future consultants, you need to learn these tricks. And of course you have to pass your examinations. So uh, you can club the physiological maneuvers under the following headings. You can club Valsalva maneuver and sudden standing from squatting or lie down as one group because the physiological changes are same. And whatever findings you will see, you will find it would be common to both of them. You can, you can club Muller's maneuver and passive leg raising as one group. You can, then you can have a sudden squatting and you can have isometric exercises as separate things. And you can have pharmacological maneuvers like amine nitride uh, in, injections. So Valsalva is something that many a times it is asked and you must be sure about Valsalva, even if you want to skip other parts of dynamic auscultation, you must be sure about Valsalva and what are the findings in Valsalva, especially if you get a case of HOCM or mitral valve prolapse or so on and so forth. So Valsalva is something that many examiners are fond of. They want to understand because when you understand Valsalva, when you can explain Valsalva clearly, then uh, probably the examiner thinks that your understanding of uh, circulatory physiology is adequate. So how do you do Valsalva maneuver? You, commonly can um, deep inspiration followed by forceful expirations against a closed glottic for 20 seconds or a more scientific way to tell the examiner, even if you are not able to do it in your exam, to tell the examiner that the scientific way to do it is to exhale into a mercury manometer to generate and maintain a pressure of 40 millimeter of mercury for 20 seconds. So when you do for 20 seconds, you break the 20 seconds into the first 10 seconds, the next 10 seconds, and, and the various phases of Valsalva are defined according to the sustenance of this pressure for 20 seconds. Uh, normally changes in intensity of the murmur and heart sounds are recorded only in stage two, and Valsalva is contraindicated in severe ischemic heart disease and LV, severe, uh, very, very severe LV outflow obstructions. So the stages of Valsalva, the first 10 seconds is the onset of straining. Here, there is a raise, there is an increase in the intrathoracic pressure uh, that leads to, because of aortic compression and your BP rises and your heart rate falls. The phase two between 10 seconds and 20 seconds where all your findings should be, uh, sh uh, should be uh, read by you, should be recorded by you. So, the second phase of Falsalva is the, is the phase where you base all your clinical findings to. It is, it is a time between 10 and 20 seconds of sustained expiration. Here, the BP starts to fall and the heart rate starts to increase because of the venous compression and your venous, comp and your, and your venous return starts to get compromised. And the whole physiology is decreased in the venous returns to the right side and the left side of the heart, leading to fall in blood pressure and leading to an increase in the heart rate. The phase three is just at the end of the expiration. There is a further fall in the blood pressure and increase in the heart rate because of the sudden uh, you know, compliance of the pulmonary uh, blood, which is increased. And phase four is the overshoot in the next five to 10 seconds is overshoot uh, where the BP rises and the heart rate falls because of the sympathetic overactivities. And in, in, the, in the phase one, you have raise in the BP uh, and fall in heart rate. Phase two, your BP starts to fall. Your venous return decreases uh, to both right first and then left side of the heart. In phase three, there is further fall in blood pressure. And in phase four, there is, uh, there is an increase in the pressure and there may be actually an overshoot based from your baseline. So you, you get various sorts of response. The, the thing that Many examiners ask you about a square wave response where, where the blood pressure rises 
in phase one, but fails to fall in phase two and phase three, fails to fall in phase two, the square root sign, the square root response is a finding of mitral stenosis, ASDs, and severe left ventricular failure, in which the BP elevates in stage one, but remains so in stage two and three, and there is an absence of overshoot. The mechanism of square root sign is that lungs are already in this condition, overloaded with fluid. So whatever happens, whatever breathing you do, uh, these, this extra fluid continues to get pumped into the left ventricle in whatever phase of straining. So there is actually no fall in your blood pressure and the blood pressure remains elevated and maintains a square root kind of sign. So of all the physiological explanations of stage two, uh, mostly can be explained by the decrease in the venous return. There is a decrease in the venous stroke volume. There is increase in the pressure in the great arteries. Therefore, uh, uh, the LV S, uh, S3 and S4, both left and right sided, will become softer. There would be a decrease in the intensity of aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, mitral regurgitation, and tricuspid regurgitation murmur. The, why I said that Valsalva is many a times required for your HOCMs and MVP, because whenever we get, you know, sort of a finding of a case of HOCMs, when you have an LVDP fall, so uh, two things happen. So remember the intensity of HOCM murmur, the ejection systolic murmur of HOCM is, is dependent upon three things. It is dependent upon preload, afterload, and contractility. So anything that causes a decrease in the preload or a decrease in the afterload or an increase in the contractility would increase the murmur of HOCM. So anything that causes decrease in LV, decrease in preload, decrease in afterload, or increase in contractility would cause a louder HOCM murmur. And as you see, the preload is decreased here, the LV EDP is decreased. At the same point of time, BP, the BP is also getting decreased, the blood pressure is also getting decreased, so afterload is also getting decreased. So both preload and afterload, predominantly preload is getting lower in, in, in the cases of phase two of Valsalva, so the murmur of HOCM will increase while the murmur of aortic stenosis, as you see here, was decreasing. So that's how you separate aortic stenosis from an HOCM murmur. At the same point of time, uh, the murmur of MVP. So MVP and HOCM tend to follow the same kind of pattern. But the difference is here is many a times we say that the murmur of MVP increases. So it's not actually the volume of the murmur that is increasing. It's actually the duration of the murmur that is decreasing. So I've told you earlier that there's something called as the click volume. So whenever you have less fluid in your LV, so there is uh, so the critical volume. So in, in mitral regurgitation, in, uh, in mitral valve prolapse syndrome, the leaflets are too big for, um, for the ventricle. And whenever the ventricle reaches a critical click volume, the leaflets will prolapse into the atria. So if the ventricles are already smaller with less fluid um, in, uh, less blood in them at the onset of, uh, of systole, then the click volumes is reached earlier. So, S, so the click moves closer to S1, murmur becomes longer. So whenever you have a phase, you are recording phase two of Valsalva maneuver, you have a decrease um, of uh, blood returning to your left ventricle, your LV EDP falls, your HOCM murmur increases, and your mitral valve prolapse syndrome murmur becomes longer, and your click becomes closer to S1. So these are all the physiological things uh, that happen with mitral, uh, with the stage two of Valsalva. The rapid standing from squatting or lying down position will also have the same return. You have, you have less amount of you have decreased venous return and the findings are essentially same as the phase two of Valsalva. The Muller maneuver is the opposite of Valsalva and passive leg raising. Both these maneuvers will actually increase the venous return and have a completely opposite effect of Valsalva maneuver um, on various findings. Passive leg raising, you have to remember that it's a passive raising. You cannot ask the patient to raise his leg. You have to ask the patient to lie in a supine position, uh, keep his knees straight, and elevate his legs from your own hand at 45 degrees and note the changes after 15 to 20 seconds. 
and there uh, you can you can note the changes i would not uh, for the sake of time and for the sake of complexities the other things essentially when you talk about uh, dynamic auscultations most commonly uh, valsalva would be discussed but of course you can read about squattings and isometric exercises <coughs> in detail on your own or we can have a second uh, round of uh, talk sometimes later but whenever we whenever i was i was remember i started my talk with softer signs so do not become so obsessed with valsalva maneuver that you stop seeing other things of uh, a brisk up stroke or, or a slow up stroke in your pulse or the kind of apex that you are getting the kind of heart sounds that you are getting and trying to make a diagnosis so do not base your findings do not base your final diagnosis on these soft findings and dynamic auscultation if it is not matching with the other findings and history of your examination you will lose track of every other thing if you go on for soft findings and brownie points and miss on a hard end point especially if these fall and mainly if these soft findings are against the natural course your course has been uh, your exam has been going across because you see the sensitivity and specificity of all these tests is very very low while well, salva is a little high specific but the sensitivity is very low here the only sensitivity high sensitivity and specificity uh, and positive predictive values and negative predictive values especially are high for uh, just inspiration and expiration in which the right sided murmurs and right sided heart sounds are affected more than the left side so apart from inspiration and expiration it's very difficult to base your entire examination just upon based upon your dynamic auscultation and things like that and uh, that's that's how i would like to end today it's it was a very long i just uh, i'm sure there is a lot that dr justin can add and uh, if there is anything that is discrepant from the way it is being taught in your institutions if there has been any discrepancy in the thought process between uh, and it may happen between different examiners and different things sometimes different textbooks also differ on clinical examination the way to do them the way to interpret them uh, so i would first like to ask uh, all the panel members i can see dr justin here all the panel members about if there was anything discrepant that that you all teach your student uh, firstly because they are the dm students i don't want them to go back with anything you know and and mess up the examination so if there's any discrepancy i would like you to highlight that and then probably your own comments upon anything uh, that we have missed or you think is is relevant so thank you very much uh, dr ish am i audible yes, yes you are well, thank you very much uh, dr ish it was an excellent presentation in fact you have taken almost uh, one hour and 55 minutes of continuous talking we should really thank you for that and uh, we may not have a lot of time but i think we need to address some of the genuine questions that have come from the students and uh, i don't think you know we widely disagree with any of uh, those things that you have uh, been you have discussed so i mean most of us agree on the same points because you did not really uh, you know major on any minor things you are majoring on only the major things and it was quite an interesting thing to listen I, in fact i never thought somebody could do justice to this topic in just two hours time but you really did justice so i i will probably address one or two questions and then maybe the panelists can start uh, addressing some of them there is one question by dr sandeep mohanty why s2 occurs sometime after the closure of semilunar valve any specific reason Uh, actually dr uh, rishi had addressed this thing maybe to make it more clearer to you why valve does not close even after the pressure has gone gone below the expected level where it is supposed to close this is basically in line with the newton's law of motion that is inertia yeah, anything that continues to move continues to move in the same direction the same speed unless it is stopped by anything external this is the law, first law of motion so the blood continues to move out of the pulmonary artery even after the pushing force of the right ventricle is over it continues to flow the only limiting factor is the resistance it is going to face in a compliant circulation the resistance is low as a result there is a little longer time for which the blood flows from the 
right ventricle into the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary valve is able to close only after that period of time, which is related to the complaints of the circulation. I hope uh, that makes sense to uh, Dr. Sandeep Mohanty. Then one, Dr. Prachi Sharma, she, she has asked, why Kusmal sign is absent in cardiac tamponade? In fact, I saw one of the same question the panel side also. It's a very interesting question. And uh, I think I should appreciate you for thinking about this because uh, obviously you understand the mechanism of constrictive pericarditis. You also understand the mechanism of Kusmal sign. You understand the mechanism of uh, uh, pulses, paradoxes in uh, cardiac tamponade. So, for this, why it is not get you are not getting a small sign in uh, <clears throat> cardiac tamponade is the question. So, small sign can occur only if there is some process limiting the myocardial response to increasing intrathoracic pressure. So, whenever the increase increasing intrathoracic negative pressure is getting transmitted to the right heart, the blood comes in. The normal response is so the drop in the systemic venous pressure as the lung expands, so blood gets sucked. And the stiffened heart is unable to expand during inhalation, as happens in constrictive pericarditis or restricted cardiomyopathy. So we get the Kusmal sign. But why this is not happening in cardiac tamponade? Here also you have a watery cage that is compressing the heart. Yet earlier there was a fibrous cage that was compressing the heart. Here there is a watery cage that is compressing the heart. Now, the large pericardial effusion or a hemopericardium that causes tamponade does not limit the ability of the blood to be sucked into the heart. And the drop in the intrathoracic pressure translates as an expected drop in venous pressure. Why? What happens here is when the patient inhales in cardiac tamponade, the blood that is sucked into the right ventricle, right side of the heart, since it cannot expand outwardly, because of the cardiac tamponade, it expands leftward by compressing the septum. And as a result, compresses the LV. So this leads to a greater room for some more blood coming and at the cost of decreasing LV preload and obviously the uh, pulses paradoxes takes place. To some extent, the same mechanism that produces pulses paradoxes is in a way responsible for maintenance or absence of small sign in constrictive pericarditis. You just work on this thing and maybe you know, you'll be able to understand uh, that it does make some sense. Uh, I Maybe I request the other panelists also to uh, look into some other questions that are there. Anyone else? How do, is there anyone else who would like to take or should I continue answering? We can you can continue. I think just you know, I'm, I'm just resigning. Yeah, you you you. Oh, Murli, you are there. You know, you can also basically uh, contribute to that. Doctor Sandeep is asking. Uh, Doctor Sandeep is asking the same thing. Have you taken this question? Uh, difference between apex beat and apical impulse? No, sir. Not 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 done. Okay. So I so I hope I was I, I probably I did not make myself clear. So when you when you say apex beat then you are only referring to a point of which has got a very classical description of a downwards and the outermost point of a definite cardiac impulse. It will just tell you whether cardiomegaly is present or not. If apex, if that location of the lowermost and the downmost point is, is beyond your mid clavicular line uh, and going down to anything down to sixth intercostal space and lower, then there is a cardiomegaly. But since the definition contains the word point, then you cannot describe it as an area that apical impulse, when you describe, you describe that the area has to be less than 2.5 centimeters and restricted to one and it's forceful, it is not forceful. With a point, you cannot make that differentiation. So whenever you say, speak apical apex beat, only for cardiomegaly present or not. And in apical impulse, you can describe all the characteristics of the apex of force, sustenance, uh, thrill. So, so apex beat is a point defining only cardiomegaly or not. Apical impulse is every other part of, uh, of the examination and description. 
to add to Dr. Rishi Sethi's point, the easy way is you see apex beat in the supine position or the sitting position to tell where it is. But to learn about apical impulse, you can turn the patient left lateral. You can feel the thing. So suppose you say, sir, can I say cardiomegaly by turning the patient left lateral? You are wrong. Whereas to understand the character of the apical impulse, you can take the patient to left lateral or the story right lateral. You can feel the pulse and you can describe the character. But to say apex beat, it is a location. I like that Rishi Hachi rightly pointed out. Any other questions to be discussed? Some more open. How to check pulses? Nice, nice discussion going on. Thank you. Somebody would like to take it. How to some of the questions which can be answered by texting. I'm just 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 testing them in the group, sir. Uh, yeah. Someone has asked how to identify forceful sustain when there is going to be severe attrition. He can. He, there is no need to always compare it with uh, uh, aortic uh, carotid pulse. He can auscultate to identify whether it's going to cross for more than fifty percent of systole or not. The cause of white split in RCMP and CCP. It's not totally one of the common causes. Yeah. Of, uh, White spit, I don't think so. I mean, whenever, whenever myocardium is going to get involved or associated or right ventral branch block, we can expect a, a white spit. Otherwise, I don't think there's a reason to have a white spit. Am I right, sir? Yeah, yeah. I think so. What you have to look at it, uh, doc, I think Dr. Ashethi clearly explained. See, white spit S2 can be due to early A2 or delayed P2. Is there something that can produce early A2 or delayed P2 in whatever you call a restrictive cardiomyopathy? Now, to call, produce a delayed P2, you need to have either it can be a mechanical delay or an electrical delay. Mechanical delay cannot happen because generally a systolic dysfunction is very uncommon. And uh, when it happens, it can produce a delay in mechanical systole, producing a delayed P2. Or if there is an electrical delay because of right bundle branch block uh, developing in such a patient, you can have a delayed P2. And obviously, in such situations, you may be having a a white split uh, second heart sound in restrictive cardiomyopathy. How to differentiate as MVP and HCM uh, by doing well salva is clearly described in most of the textbooks. Just to save time, we are not able, we are not going to describe everything. Uh, it's clearly uh, described in most of the textbooks. You can go through it. Uh, Dr. Rishi Sethi has already clearly mentioned whenever you are in doubt, you do dynamic auscultation. If you are very clear, don't do dynamic auscultation. But most of the examiners who are uh, uh, old school or from old school of thought, they definitely will expect dynamic school of dynamic auscultation. Please be ready to know uh, what, what is anticipated at least when you are even if you are clear about dynamic auscultation. So, and discuss squatting, I think, uh, I mean, uh, it's not something that we need to discuss now at this point of time. It is a, a long stuff. You have a lot of books discussing all that. Any specific queries, I think we can discuss. How to check pulses, paradoxes, and pulses alternans. Pulses alternans is uh, irrespective of the phases of respiration. Every alternate beats is strong and weak. So just, you don't need to look at the respiration. You just concentrate. You can, in fact, uh, sometimes I personally feel closing my eyes is better to, uh, you know, uh, and appreciate my sense of uh, feeling as I feel the weak and the strong pulses. Every alternate pulse is weak and strong. There is pulses all plans. Whereas in pulses, paradoxes, what happens is when the patient breathes in, your uh, pulse volume comes down. And ideally speaking, you check it with the Spigma manometer and make sure that how much is the drop, it is more than 20, you take it as positive. Yeah. In fact, one important point I'd like to mention is to me measure pulses paradoxes, and not only that, even for a dynamic auscultation during respiratory phase, do not ask the patient to do a deep breathing. That will change the whole dynamics. Allow the patient to hope I'm audible. I'm audible. Uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so allow the patient, do not disturb his breathing pattern 
patient should breathe without having any conscience of his breathing then only the hemodynamics will be well elicited for pulse paradox a simple thing connect the sigma manometer don't disturb don't tell him about the breathing pattern like that day even dr triplus was saying raise the sigma manometer suppose bp 120 80 140 raise it another 20 30 mm above come down slowly at one point you will start listening coracle sounds only during expiration and during inspiration it won't be there keep coming down coming down coming at a point both will be here in what we used to measure it also older books used to say you can measure it also to say severity of uh, pulse paradox but not uh, really uh, worth while all the time but important point is the term pulse paradox kusmal proposes kusmal contributed a lot to clinical medicine he said though it is a common thing inspiration pp falls it is exaggerated during pulse paradox so the paradox is not that the paradox is kusmal is feeling the pulse there is a heart beat but there is no pulse that is the paradox he said there's a heart beat you could feel the epical impulse but i mean heart beat you can hear but you don't feel a pulse that is the pulse paradox a great clinician kusmal he contributed everything i think we talked about kusmal breathing kusmal other kusmal sign also we can go in i think there was a little bit of a uh, mistake in one of my statements that when you calculate the normal hemoglobin in a cyanotic individual i gave the formula as a 34 minus it's actually 38 Minus one fourth of oxygen saturation. That should be the normal value. So, uh, for example, if you have a, a oxygen saturation of eighty, then um, the one fourth of that eighty would be twenty, and thirty eight minus twenty. Uh, that that should be um, that should be your normal uh, hemoglobin Perfect. oxygen saturation. Perfect. Perfect. Beautiful. I mean, it's for the real academic field. And uh, any, I mean, somebody has asked for repeating the answer. Do not worry. All these things will be available in online recording in the YouTube channel of uh, Ramachandra Medical College, Srihar. So you will be able to look into it and uh, get the answers back. And and in that WhatsApp group, you can type the questions. We'll try to send you the answer also whenever feasible. We'll definitely do it. so it was uh, quite an interesting uh, time thanks dr mogli okay yeah, i should thank you jasin and uh, dr ishi sethi wonderful in fact i was driving 100 km and i was listening it was like a beautiful music i can hear in the car thank you so, thank you thank you, thank you so uh, much thank yeah. you dr ishi sir it was i know how uh, difficult uh, you uh, how uh, difficult uh, what are the difficulties you encounter in making this presentation done He was very busy. I, I was trying to call him. He was uh, posted in a different place, in a remote place in this COVID era, as part of uh, uh, my major district nodal officer for COVID. In spite of it, he, he was able to prepare a wonderful talk for us. Uh, we are extremely thankful uh, to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Justin, sir. Thank you, Murli, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It was a thank pleasure. Thank you, audience, for the excellent questions that you had typed in. Quite interesting questions. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you thank you good night